Let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 40 today. Last time we talked about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, the destruction of the Solomonic Temple, all these things happening because of the judgment of God for sin. And Jeremiah has been the prophet for the last 40 years to the people of Judah. And he has warned them repeatedly that this was coming, that it was coming because of sin, that it could have been mitigated somewhat if they had repented and started doing things properly according to the covenant of God. Uh, They needed to have uh, surrendered to the king of Babylon and his forces, and they they would have even been able to keep the temple and their city. But God already knew that they were not going to stop. They were not going to repent and that everything was going to come to an end. So we know that the wall was breached in the fourth month, and then in the fifth month, uh, the the commander of the Babylonian army was sent by Nebuchadnezzar to take the place down. Uh, The temple and the city uh, was burned starting on the 10th day of the fifth month, and uh, the uh, things of value in the city and the temple were accounted for and uh, then transported away at that same time. Now, we know that Jeremiah was rescued uh, during this time period because he doesn't burn up with the city. So when we take the things that we studied yesterday and compare them with the things that we studied today, uh, we come to this sort of logistical arrangement. Once the city was taken... And uh, they were starting to make arrangements to, to dismantle and burn it to the ground. They were going through the city house by house, building by building, and capturing or uh, taking into custody uh, civilians uh, that were willing to uh, surrender at this point. And when they got to the palace, they would have found... In the prison there, people that had been uh, imprisoned under the uh, leadership of King Zedekiah that he didn't like, he didn't like what they'd done, and one of the reasons that he would have put some of them in there was because they were pro-Babylonian. So when the Babylonians empty the prison, they would have taken everybody there to the administrative camp that's located a few miles north of Jerusalem at the city of Ramah. And it is there that Jeremiah is finally identified as that prophet that Nebuchadnezzar wants special treatment done to. And so we take up the story today at Ramah. uh, Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from he who is after Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had let him go from Ramah when he took him bound in chains along with all the captives of Jerusalem and Judah who were being exiled to Babylon. So when he was first taken out of the prison, he was in chains. Once he arrived at Ramah, and it was discovered that he was the prophet Jeremiah, those chains were removed, and he was no longer on a mandatory exile list. Because Nebuchadnezzar said, you let him do whatever he wants. Verse number two. The captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, He who is your God pronounced this disaster against this place. He who is has brought it about and has done as he said. Because you sinned against he who is and did not obey his voice, this thing has come upon you. Now, behold, I release you today from the chains on your hands. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come. I'll look after you well. But if it seems wrong to you to come with me to Babylon, do not come. See, 
The whole land is before you. Go wherever you think is good and right to go. If you remain, then return to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon appointed governor of the cities of Judah and dwell with him among the people. Or go ever where, wherever you think is right to go. And so the captain of the guard gave him an allowance of food and a present and let him go. So this Nebuzaradan, he knows just as well as his boss, Nebuchadnezzar II, knows that Jeremiah has been predicting all of this for decades. And it happened exactly as he predicted. So he is clearly a prophet of a powerful deity. And so he is going to be treated with respect by them. So he's not going to be forced to go anywhere he doesn't want to go. And he is told by Nebuzaradan, I'd love to have you come to Babylon with me. I would take care of you. Uh, Nebuzaradan is probably a younger man by quite a bit than Jeremiah. Jeremiah is almost certainly in his early 60s. Uh, Nebuzaradan, an active military officer of this time, probably in his 40s, I would guess. So he basically says, I would be happy for you to come back to Babylon with me, and I would take care of you for the rest of your life. But if that's not what you want, you want to stay here, that's fine too. Uh, you have all of the land in front of you. You have the king's permission to go wherever you want to go, do whatever you want to do. Uh, and uh, the only thing that he recommended was go check in with the Babylonian governor, a Jewish man, Gedaliah. Uh, check in with him first and then do whatever it is you want to do. And then he gave him uh, provisions. He gave him a gift and uh, turned him loose uh, so that he could head back to Jerusalem if he wished to do so. Uh, verse number six says, Jeremiah went to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, at Mizpah and lived with him among the people who were left in the land. So we find out that uh, Gedaliah has set up his headquarters at a nearby town uh, called Mitzpah. And uh, that is where he's going to govern the place from, because Jerusalem is just ruins by the time we get to this part of the story. Jeremiah chapter number 30. I think is where we go next. Jeremiah chapter number 30. The word that came to Jeremiah from he who is. Thus says he who is the God of Israel. Write in a book or in a scroll all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, declares he who is, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah, says he who is, and I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. Uh, we've seen this several times now, that in the midst of judgment, a bit of hope is given. A promise of a better future is provided. And so here it is again, God saying, I promise that I'm going to bring a righteous remnant back to the land. Verse 4, these are the words that he who has spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Thus says he who is. We've heard a cry of panic, of terror, and no peace. So that would definitely have been true with all of the disasters coming upon the Israelis. Ask now and see. Can a man bear a child? So the question is, can a man have a baby? Well, wh why is he even asking that? Of course, that's not possible. Well, why then do I see every man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Why has every face turned pale? So he's basically making this, uh, this comparison to what it looks like when a woman is going through labor 
that's how the guys are acting with the the disaster that has come upon the land. Alas, that day is so great. There's none like it. It is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved out of it. So despite the fact that this is a day of great distress, a period of great distress for the descendants of Jacob, the descendants of Israel, there is salvation that can be brought out of this. Verse 8, It shall come to pass in that day, declares he who is of the hosts of the armies, that I will break his yoke from off his neck, and I will burst your bonds, and foreigners shall no more make a servant of him. Now, immediately, we come into an eternal Messianic kingdom passage here. Uh, Because we know that after the return from the Babylonian, the Assyrian exiles, when the people were back in the land and things were restarted again and the covenant was reestablished with the people of Israel, that that was not the end of their problems because sin continued and uh, they were allowed to be overrun by foreigners again on several occasions, uh, but particularly by Rome whenever the city of Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70. So this passage Its prophecies have to be about after that, when foreigners shall no more make a servant of him. So that's got to be when Yehoshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, comes back a second time and establishes his eternal kingdom. Verse number nine, but they shall serve he who is their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Now, there's a couple of ways that people have tried to tackle this prophecy here. Uh, Some of the people will put David here as a representation of Jesus the Messiah. He's the son of David, so David kind of stands as a substitute for the unnamed future son of David. But others, and I find myself in this camp, believe that David will in fact be resurrected in the second coming of Jesus Christ, and will serve as an administrative leader in the millennial kingdom under Jesus as the over-king. And so uh, David uh, could very well be an administrative leader in the eternal kingdom after his resurrection. Verse number 10. Then fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares he who is, nor be dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save you from far away and your offspring from the land of their captivity, meaning bringing them back. Jacob shall return and have quiet and ease, and none shall make him afraid, for I am with you to save you. Now again, how do we interpret this? Is this about them coming back from Assyrian and and Babylonian exile and being called out of the faraway countries where they'd been in order to come back? Uh, Others would suggest that maybe this is about modern history when Israelis from the time of the Russian persecutions uh, around the time of the First World War and then the Nazi persecutions of the Second World War Uh, Israelis, ethnic Israelis, have been drawn back to the Holy Land, back to the Promised Land, uh, and have reestablished themselves there. Uh, I understand why some people would go that direction. I don't think that is what is in mind here, because this seems to be much more about a full return to God. And we know that the vast majority of Israelis living in, in modern state of Israel are They're atheistic, uh, or if they are religious, they don't believe in Yehoshua as Messiah. And so that's problematic. Uh, So I am much more of the bent to think this is about the second coming of Jesus again. When the people are bringing, being brought back from a land of captivity of death, They're being saved from far away out of death into the resurrection of the righteous and the transformation of the living. And uh, they're being brought back to the land 
uh, because they've been caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And he comes back to the Mount of Olives at his second coming, and they will always be with him. And so I really think that's what it's got to do with. I, I'm also quite uh, taken by the fact that we keep seeing the word salvation or save in close proximity to the divine name, such as this, verse 11, for I am with you to save you, declares he who is. And those of you that have been my students for a while, you know that the name Yehoshua, Jesus' Hebrew name, is made up of the word salvation and the shortened form of the divine name. Yehoshua means literally he who is salvation, using the divine name uh, as the he who is part. So, I am with you to save you, declares he who is. I will make a full end of all the nations, the ethnic groups among whom I scattered you. But of you, I will not make a full end. I will discipline you in just measure, and I will by no means leave you unpunished. So there's still going to be tough times in the future. This is prophesied here. But the intention is to discipline them and bring them into right relationship with him. Verse 12, For thus says he who is, Your hurt is incurable, your wound is grievous. There is none to uphold your cause, no medicine for your wound, no healing for you. So you're in a bad way. All your lovers have forgotten you. They care nothing for you. For I have dealt you the blow of an enemy, the punishment of a merciless foe, because your guilt is great, because your sins are flagrant. We're back to the whole idea of why God was so tough on them with the destruction of Jerusalem. It's because of sin. Why do you cry out over your hurt? Your pain is incurable because your guilt is great, because your sins are flagrant. I've done these things to you. Therefore, all who devour you shall be devoured. All your foes, every one of them, shall go into captivity. Those who plunder you shall be plundered, and all who prey on you I will make prey. For I will restore health to you, and your wounds I will heal, declares he who is, because they have called you out an outcast. It is Zion for whom no one cares. So God tells them, even in the midst of judgment, I'm the only one that can fix your issues. And all the ones that are calling you names and doing nasty things to you in the midst of all the judgment that I've brought upon you, they can't fix your problems either. You need to call on me. I'm the one that will deal with all your problems, including those that trouble you, which is a fulfillment, once again, of the Abrahamic promise. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Verse 18, thus says he who is, behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwellings. The city shall be rebuilt on its mound. The palace shall stand where it used to be, and out of them shall come songs of thanksgiving and the voices of those who celebrate. I will multiply them, they shall not be few. I will make them honored, they shall not be small. Their children shall be as they were of old, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all who oppress them. Their princes, their prince shall be one of themselves, their ruler shall come out of their midst. I will make him draw near, and he shall approach me. For who would dare of himself to approach me, declares he who is. So promises again of restoration, of peace and prosperity, of rebuilding and restoration, and their prince, another name for their king, is going to come from their midst. And of course, we know that the Messiah is coming from their midst. He is going to be one of them. Uh, he is going to be from the family of David. He's going to be an Israeli, risen up amongst them. And if that's exactly who Yehoshua is. That's exactly who Jesus is. He was an Israeli come to be the Messiah for the Israelis. And thankfully for those of us that are grafted in Gentiles, for us too. And then verse 22, something that is actually quoted uh, in uh, the New Testament, uh, book of Revelation, about 
uh, the resolution of everything once Jesus is back. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. So they have been on the outs with him before because of their sin, but eventually, through repentance, through God's mercy, uh, those that will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved and be part of his people. Verse 23, Behold the storm of he who is. Wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of he who is will not turn back until he's executed and accomplished the intentions of his mind. And in the latter days, you will understand this. See, you'll understand later why this judgment had to happen. Chapter 31 continues. At that time, declares he who is, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. Now, that's an important prophecy coming in this time of history because the tribes of Israel had been broken up into different kingdoms, and the northern kingdom had already been taken into exile in 723 B.C. by the Assyrians. And now the southern kingdom, they are being taken into exile by the Babylonians in 587. But this is the promise that God is going to bring back from all of those different clans, all of those different families, all of those different tribes, those that will be his people, the righteous remnant. Verse 2, thus says he who is. The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, he who is appeared to him from far away. So the people who get through this judgment, they have the opportunity in exile to meet up with God again, to repent, and to call upon his name because he wants that relationship. So he appears with them, to them through his prophetic people. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I will continue my faithfulness to you. So this is the, this is the heart of God. I'm sticking with you because I want you to repent and be part of my family. Verse 4, Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourself with tambourines and will go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. So it's grief and sadness right now. We're going to go to the book of Lamentations before too much longer. It's really sad and down and moaning right now with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the entire country of Judah. But God's going to bring happiness back again in the restoration and people will be singing and dancing again. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planter shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit. And there shall be a day when a watchman will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Arise, let's go up to Zion, to he who is our God. Now that is significant because Ephraim was part of the northern kingdom area, which had abandoned worship at Jerusalem. But the prophecy is that there's a day coming when people up in that part of the, of the world are going to go, hey, let's all go to Jerusalem to worship the Lord our God. Verse 7, For thus says he who is, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O oh, he who is, save our people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I'll bring them out of the north country. I'll gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman, and her who is in labor together, a great company, they shall return here. With weeping they shall come. With pleas for mercy I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. So again, we're back to this thing as to how do we apply these words. 
It's clearly about a return, a return back to Israel, back to Jerusalem, back to God. But is it the return from Babylon, the return from Assyria? Is it the return that's happened in the modern time period? Or is it the return that happens with the sound of the trumpet and the rising up of the dead saints and the transformation of the living saints and being caught up together to meet the Lord in the air.